Hey everyone, before we get into tonight's video, if you want just the audio version of this, check out my podcast, The Graveyard Shift with Mr. Davis. You can check it out on Anchor, top link in the description. It's also on Spotify, I believe it's on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and pretty much anywhere podcasts are available. Just search up The Graveyard Shift with Mr. Davis, and hours and hours and hours of stories will pop up for you to listen to just audio so you don't have to run your battery or your data up uh, listening to me while you're going through that crazy night shift <laughs> i've been there i know how it is so set that up for you all so you can check it out thanks again everyone and let's hop right into tonight's stories last week when i was taking a break in the middle of the graveyard shift at the hospital one of the other nurses ran in, looking rattled. Claire, I need you in room B, he said, his face as white as the walls surrounding us. I closed my book and craned my neck to peek into the ER. Being dragged off mid-break was nothing new, but it usually happened during an emergency, when all hands were needed on deck. This time, however, the ER was empty. There was one drunk sleeping it off across a row of benches, but aside from the sounds of his snores, everything was quiet. No one was prepping for the arrival of multiple casualties either. If we'd gotten a call, they would have already had people lined up with gurneys by the door. Still, despite all appearances, Chris wouldn't have come for me if it wasn't important. I got up and headed out to the break room. What's up, Chris? I asked as I followed him swiftly. If there was an emergency, every second counted. Chris replied, there's a 40-something Caucasian male that came in. He seems in distress, but he won't let anyone near him. I raised a brow. All right, let's have a look. Did the EMT say anything about his condition? Chris shook his head. He's a walk-in. Came alone. Looked panicked, but won't say why. He hesitated for a moment. And there was something weird about the way he walked. I nodded. We didn't always get great workups on patients, especially the walk-ins. With what little information Chris gave me, I can only assume the patient had hurt his leg or something like that. If I wanted to know what was going on, I'd have to examine him myself. I entered emergency room B and found the patient standing in the corner. He was tall, but not unnaturally so. Wore a fancy suit, polished black shoes, and white silk gloves. Every single button on his dress shirt had been done up. In fact, it looked uncomfortably tight. His collar pressed against his Adam's apple so snugly that I could imagine it leaving a mark. I could hear his strained, panicked breath as he struggled to inhale through the constriction. Like many balding, middle-aged men, his hair had gravitated to his chin, but I could still read the worry and terror through the bush hiding his tense facial features. His eyes darted side to side like an antique cat clock. If I had to guess, based on his attire, my money would have been on a limo driver of some sort, but even then, the quality of his tailor's suit seemed a few notches above their usual uniform. Hi, sir. My name's Claire, and this is Chris. We're here to help you, I said softly. He twitched, but didn't reply. Chris whispered. He hasn't said a single word since he got here. Not one. I took a step forward and saw the man's jaw clenching in response. I lifted my hands non-threateningly and took another cautiously slow step. Listen, I'm here to help you, alright? My hands slowly slid down to my stethoscope. He watched me with almost impossibly dilated eyes, showing barely a sliver of his green irises. He must have been on some heavy drugs, I figured. Sir, I just need to take your vitals. It won't hurt, I promise. He continued to stare, but made no effort to escape as I bridged the distance between us. I pressed the chest piece against him and slipped the earpieces on. I closed my eyes and listened, expecting to hear a thrashing heartbeat. But instead, there was a constant, shallow droning sound, like the depths of the ocean or the cosmic hum of solar radiation. I pulled my stethoscope back and touched it to my own chest to test it. It was working. I could hear the pitter-patter of my heart. 
Now, almost unnerved as Chris, I put the stethoscope back on our speechless patient. Still, all I heard was that same otherworldly noise. Chris picked up the empty chart and looked at me. Pulse? He asked nervously. I was torn between not scaring my patient and giving Chris an honest reply. I hoped Chris would understand the subtle head shake I gave him. There was no reason for my patient not to have a heartbeat, though. He had to be alive. He was breathing, moving, and responding to what was happening around him. He was quiet, sure, but looked otherwise normal. Maybe the stethoscope couldn't capture his heartbeat through the thick layers of the suit. I took a calming breath and reached my arm around back to try and slide up his shirt. This man, however, stopped me. His arms swatted at mine, and though the impact was light and painless, the movement itself was enough to stop me in my tracks. I pulled away, sweat dripping from the sides of my face as I lifted my hands up to show him I meant no harm. The way his arm had moved, it... It wasn't normal. It was, in fact, distinctively abnormal. I'm not sure how to describe it without making it sound stupid, but you know those long, colorful, inflatable decorations outside of car dealerships? Those cylindrical men with goofy faces that flap around? As silly as that sounds, his arm movement reminded me of them. The way it bent, the ripple that sent through his clothes as he unraveled it, as though it were hollow inside. That's the only imagery it evoked. I wiped my brow and looked at the man. All right, I'm sorry if I scared you. I just wanted to check your pulse. He shuddered. I could see that odd effect now again, this time across his entire body. The way it moved wasn't right. It was as though there was nothing but wind holding this suit in place. I took a step back and grabbed Chris's arm, pulling him out of the room for a one-on-one conversation. You said he was walking funny. What did you mean by that? I asked in a hushed and stressed tone. Chris looked down. He didn't seem to want to answer. He probably thought I wouldn't believe him. A flag on stilts. What? His legs, he furrowed his brows. They looked like flags on stilts. Or like those orange cone things at the airport. Look, I know it sounds crazy, but I believe you, I replied. I could feel his relief as he let out a sigh. (sighs) Should I... Should I call a doctor? Yeah. Chris stumbled down the hall. I'm not sure whether his rush was to get help as quickly as possible or to distance himself from the man inside examination room B. I couldn't blame him if it was the latter. Even I wanted to get away, and I had seen all manner of horrors come through the ER over my years. I peered into the room, but when I did, the stranger's face was inches from my own. I yelled and jumped back. He recoiled in terror, inching back to his place in the corner of the room, his body not so much moving as it was... flapping. He fell into the fetal position and held his head between his trembling hands. I'm sorry, you just startled me, I said, regaining my composure. His head slowly lifted and his eyes focused on mine. And though no sound came out, his lips moved. And I could have sworn they were wording out a plea for help. But just as I was about to answer, the doctor stormed in. I hear we've got a problem case on our hands, she said, with the lack of bedside manner typical of veterans in the ER. Dr. Olmar, there's something wrong. Well, come on now, stand up, she barked at the patient. If waves could turn broken pieces of a beer bottle into smooth rocks, then the ER could do the opposite to the empathy of their staff. 
especially when the doctor in question had been on duty for almost 48 hours. The man stayed in place, claiming up now more than ever. I can't examine you on the floor, sir, Dr. Olmar said dryly. If you want treatment, you're going to have to cooperate. I chewed at the inside of my cheeks. It wasn't typically a nurse's place to speak up against a doctor, but I had years of seniority under my belt. Still, I used my authority sparingly. It was imperative to maintain a pleasant working environment. Doctor, you're scaring him. She let out an insulted huff. (laughs) Get him on the bed. I nodded and knelt down in front of the suited stranger. We need to move you. I promise we'll make it all better, okay? He shook his head, his lips quivering and eyes showing both desperation and nearly tangible fear. We won't hurt you, I whispered. I could feel the doctor's patience waning. I held out my hand. Come on, let's get you up. He moved, just barely, but I could tell he was about to reach for my hand and get up. It seemed, however, that Dr. Ulmer had waited long enough. Without warning, she stomped over to us, grabbed his arm, and pulled. I... I can't tell you for sure how it went down. It all happened so fast. I know one of the buttons on his dress shirt came off. I found it later under the bed as I was clearing the room. And I think Dr. Olma tugged so hard it popped off and his shirt opened just to crack. I heard the sound of a deflating balloon as I felt a rush of scorching hot air fizzle out of my patient. Then, his figure seemed to shrivel and I heard something hit the floor. Dr. Olmer let out an uncharacteristic scream as she stumbled back and looked at the scene. I, on the other hand, stared in shock at the pile of clothes laying in front of me. There was a bulge in the middle of it. I reached for the suit and gently pulled it like a used tablecloth. There, under the soft fabric, was his head, a length of spine dangling from it. I don't know if I screamed, or if the shock was so great that I went emotionally numb. I just remember looking at the now blank, lifeless head as it rocked back and forth to a stop. There was no blood, no smell, no groans of agony, just a perfectly, almost surgically decapitated head in an empty suit. No ID was found on the man. No one showed up looking for him, and without hands, it was impossible to run his prints. As far as I know, his head was sent to the corner for autopsy, where it has since either been preserved or disposed of. I'll probably never know what happened to him, but based on the fear I saw in his eyes, I have a feeling whatever it was, it wasn't intentional. I always swore I'd never tell this story because I've always felt, what's the point? I don't know how many of you have been in strange situations, but sometimes something so batshit crazy happens, you realize no matter how much you want the truth out there, no sane person would believe you. I guess that's what the internet is for though, right? You get to put your crazy stories out there and hope to God that at least some people take you seriously. Maybe that's worth it. Or maybe this is just some kind of fucked up therapy for me. I'm not sure. Either way, I've decided I might as well post this and see if anyone else has had a similar experience or heard about something like what I saw. At the very least, maybe the person listening to this will get some entertainment out of it. Which is good for you, because all I have is scars. 
about a decade ago, I was camping in the Midwestern United States. I'm not going to specify where because I don't want anyone trying to go looking for anything. My two brothers, Earl and Thomas, had convinced me to take a road trip and see parts of the country we'd never seen before. Although we'd all grown up in Oregon, we never really were the outdoorsy type, and I suppose the thought of earning our stripes through trial by fire sounded appealing to us. Little did we know it'd be one hell of a trip. From pulling our remaining money into buying an RV and everything we'd need for our little excursion to spending countless hours researching and arguing about proper survival methods and the various hikes I forced my brothers to go on to prepare them for the wilderness, it was tough, but worth it. After getting everything settled and about a week's worth of driving around God knows where, we settled on a campsite. Because we decided to do this during the summer, we'd figured it'd be warm enough for such a trip to be feasible, and we found a park to leave the RV out while we hiked out to a spot. We set up camp for at least a couple of days, and everything went fine. But, on that third day, we noticed something very fucking wrong. Earl woke me up early in the morning to show me that right at the foot of our sleeping bags was a full-grown elk. I saw its neck twisted damn near 180 degrees. Now, the first thing I'm thinking isn't why the hell is there an elk here, it's what the hell is strong enough to break a 700-pound animal's neck. Rationally, You'd think the answer would be bear, but why the hell would a bear make a kill just to not eat it? What also made it seem unlikely that this was a bear was that we didn't see any bite or claw marks. On top of that, we didn't hear a struggle, and it's pretty unlikely that a bear would dump a fresh kill in front of three sleeping people. Honestly, that should have been our sign to leave, but being the young dumbasses we were, we decided to just move in case the carcass attracted any other predators. The rest of the day went pretty normal, save for Thomas twisting his ankle pretty badly on a hike, but outside of that, we made it to the end of the night in one piece. The second bit of weirdness occurred at night, when we were all sitting around the fire drinking beers and telling stories. Thomas was in the middle of one about how his girlfriend almost beat the hell out of one of his exes after she sent him some... uh, interesting pictures trying to get him back. Right at the climax of the story, I swear to God, we hear what sounds like a woman crying. We all go silent and listen, and after about ten seconds, we all agree that there's someone else out there. I suggest we go check it out, but Earl isn't too sure. What are the odds that someone else will be out here with us? He asked. We're pretty far away from a campsite, and if someone did come out here, shouldn't they already be in a group that could help them? I acknowledged his concerns, but obviously someone needed our help. I grabbed a flashlight and a knife, and I was about to head out. Earl stood up and insisted on coming with. I told him I'd be right back and that he should stay with Thomas, but he wasn't budging. He told Thomas where the gun was, and that at the first sign of trouble, he should fire a warning shot in the air, and we'd come rushing back. With that, Earl and I ran toward the sound of the crying. After about a half hour search, I noticed something... strange. The crying was... moving. It seemed as though the noise was fading deeper and deeper into the forest. To that point, we hadn't seen any signs of a campsite or other people, and if this person needed help, why the hell were they going away from us? Just as I was about to turn to Earl and ask what we should do, we heard a gunshot. We booked it back to the campsite and saw Thomas, white as a ghost. He came near shot at us when we came rushing through the trees. All he could stammer out was... Eyes. We tried to calm him down, but he was mortified of... something. I looked back out at the trees, and I tried to see if my flashlight could reflect on anything, but unfortunately the trees were empty. Earl tried to get something out of Thomas, but the guy was paralyzed with fear. 
I came over and tried to take the gun away, but he just screamed at me and said, We need to get the fuck out of here. I asked him why, and he simply replied, I've never seen it before. We need to go. Earl just shrugged, and I gave in. The point of the trip was to explore and see different things anyway, so maybe it was time for us to move on. I convinced Thomas to at least sleep the night there so we could go first thing in the morning. It's not that I thought he was lying about being in danger, but if there was something out there, then it probably wouldn't be too smart to move around at night. The next day, I woke Earl and Thomas up. We packed everything away and then set off. I tried asking Thomas what he saw, but he just shook his head. He looked like he hadn't slept all night. All he would do is cling to the gun and tell us how he wanted to get the hell out of Dodge. Unfortunately, his ankle had swollen up pretty badly and it was taking us a while to make any real progress. Before we knew it, it was starting to get dark again. Thomas started freaking out and Earl yells at him to keep it cool. I can see that it's not helping, so I convince everyone to just take a breather and relax for a little bit. Thomas just keeps pressing on about how we have to keep moving, but eventually we get him to settle down. Not even 15 minutes into us resting, we hear something. Thomas reached for the gun, but Earl told him to relax and put it down. Just as I'm about to walk over, I hear that fucking crying again. But this time... It's different. Whoever it is now is full on wailing. If someone was out there, they were screaming bloody murder, and their voice carried way more than I'd even think possible. At this point, I can see Earl is getting concerned too. I tell them both that we need to go, and just as I turn around to grab my bag again, I see it. A linky, pale figure is standing about 50 feet away in between some trees. I can tell that this thing is easily over 10 feet tall, skinny as hell, and completely smooth. It had these massive hands shaped like baseball mitts with at least 15 fingers per hand. Each one had different lengths, bent in grotesquely different directions. The legs were crooked. It almost seemed as if too many bones that didn't belong were poking through the skin. Its head was much longer than that of a human head and almost conical in shape. But the most terrifying fact was that it appeared to be wearing the face of what looked to be a recently deceased person, like a mask. I could still see the blood and tendons spilling out from behind the unknown face. And in the center of the empty sockets were two pinpoint white eyes that stared back at me. I didn't even think. I simply took off towards the direction of the RV, praying that Earl and Thomas were following closely behind. I was hoping beyond hope that this was all just some horrible nightmare and that I'd wake up safe at home. As I ran, I could hear the distorted voice of a woman booming. Don't leave me. Don't leave me as bushes were trampled and branches snapped around me. In the panic, I tripped over a stump and landed face first into a pile of leaves. I felt that was it. I'd given that thing the split second advantage it needed to take me. I squeezed my eyes shut to prepare for the worst and then I heard gunshots ring out. Silence. I looked around and saw nothing. Taking my chance, I sprinted the rest of the way to the RV. By the time I got there, Earl was already waiting inside. I bolted inside and we decided to bunker down until we heard Thomas come back. He never did. We waited until the next morning and deep into the night. Nothing. As much as we wanted to believe that he would come shambling out of those woods, bruised to hell but with a smile on his face and a story to tell, we knew that wasn't happening. He was gone. I made the call to drive back to town when me calling for him was met with what sounded like a man crying. 
When we got back, we decided to tell the police, along with our family and friends, that we'd all just partied too hard and Thomas was hopped up on beer and a heavy edible. As far as they know, he ran into the forest, never to be seen again. Of course, there was a search party and investigation, but nothing ever came of it. As far as I know, everyone believes us, for whatever that's worth. People we love look at us differently now because we weren't there to protect our brother. How could you do something so stupid? Why didn't you take care of him? He's gone because of you two. It hurts. It really does. People believing that your brother is gone because of your immaturity, but what else are we supposed to say? Oh yeah, we weren't just being stupid kids. It hurts. It really does. People believing that your brother is gone because of your immaturity, but what else are we supposed to say? Oh yeah, we weren't just being stupid kids. Thomas got taken by something straight out of hell. I swear to God. No. Unfortunately, that burden is just something we're going to have to live with. I wish I could say that I went back to try and find the truth. I wish I could say I loaded up on guns and tried to avenge my brother, but truth be told, I'm scared shitless of that thing. I heard Thomas unload an entire clip into that thing, and it did jack shit. What am I going to do? I don't even exactly know where I'd go to look for it. Maybe it moved on. Maybe it's already dead. Maybe there's more of it. I... I don't know. I don't want to know. To the few people I've talked to about this, I've heard that what I saw could have been a skinwalker or a wendigo or a mimic, but it doesn't really seem to fit any description, to be honest. Whatever the answer, it's something I simply can't fuck with, so I don't. The nightmares I still have about that thing wearing my brother's face like a cheap Halloween mask is all the exposure I need. You can probably guess that I don't go into the woods much these days. I don't really need to know what else is out there. I guess in the end, the lesson I want people to take away from this is to be careful. There are things out there so far beyond what we can comprehend. It's mind-numbing. That's all I can say. Take it as you will. Just, please, be careful out there.